sing my great redeemer's praise. The glories of thy God and King, the triumph of his grace. My gracious Master and my God, assist me to
And his 65 year ministry of the gospel demonstrated that surrender on a daily basis. As a result, God's spirit filled him and used him mightily in a multifaceted ministry. John Monroe Parker was first an evangelist. He was used of God to personally win many to faith in Christ. And countless thousands came to know the Lord in his evangelistic campaigns. In his only pastor at Grace Baptist Church here in Decatur, Alabama, he did the work of an evangelist. And the church more than tripled under his ministry. For all of his ministry, he believed the word, he knew it, he believed it, he obeyed it, and he lived it. He firmly but kindly resisted the trends toward modern ecumenical evangelism, and he never once compromised in any way with those who the Word of God calls the enemies of the cross. His ministry as an evangelist permeated and energized all else that he did. Many of the devout men and women who gather today were saved as a direct result of his ministry. We remember him as an educator. He served 12 years as the assistant to the president, director of religious activities at Bob Jewish University. Later, he led Pillsbury Baptist Bible College as its president for eight years. Several of the devout men who gather today to carry him to his burial were his students during their years of preparation for the ministry. We learned from him to love the Lord and his word. We thank God that the length and shadow of his zeal for souls, his strong convictions, his kind spirit, his wisdom, and his sane judgment fell across our lives. Dr. Parker distinguished himself as a missionary statesman. His zeal for souls extended to the world perspective of the Great Commission. His article, Now is the Time, written in the Pillsbury College Bulletin in 1961, was the catalyst for the formation of Baptist World Mission. He served on the board of this mission from its inception. When it was struggling in its infancy, he agreed to serve as its general director. He sacrificially carried the ministry and for years even paid his own way to visit the missionaries on their fields of service. Under his leadership, Baptist World Mission grew from a small contingent of 12 missionaries to a present force of 208, serving the Lord in 30 countries. Some of the devout men and women from that group gather today to honor Dr. Parker. The rest of them, scattered around the world, lament his passing. We remember Dr. Parker as a friend. He was completely devoid of the big shot mentality that characterizes so many preachers. He loved, preached for, counseled, and encouraged preachers in any size church. Scores of preachers' kids grew up loving him and respecting him because he befriended them when he preached for their dads. Many of those men and women are now preachers and preachers' wives and have rejoiced to work with him as second and third generation servants of the Lord. We who worked with him in the Baptist World Mission Ministry highly esteemed him as a friend. Our board members loved him, and those who are in attendance today serve as honorary pall bearers. Mrs. Wyvon Raleigh has worked for him for 16 years. Mrs. Joanne Huggins has served 14 years as his secretary. Mrs. Judy Moritz cared for John and Penny and worked in the Parker's home when she was a student in college and has been the office manager at Baptist World Mission for 13 years. Dr. and Mrs. Ron Brooks have known him for 30 years and have served as missionaries and in the administration of the mission since 1986. Dr. Ernest Pickering was one of his ministerial students and worked with him in various causes. He has had him preach for him on numerous times and now serves as deputation director of the mission. Preachers, work associates, and some who were students with him at Bob Jones College are among the devout men and women who gather to honor his life today. Family members are among the devout men and women who gather today. We are grateful for Mrs. Ruby Parker. God providentially sent her into Dr. Parker's life. He stated, and we all knew, 
that she added years to his life and to his ministry. And Rudy, we assure you of our love, of our prayers for you. Today, we in the pattern of devout Christians before us greatly lament John Little Parker's passing. But let us remember that our sorrow is with hope. We rejoice in the confidence that he is with the one whose resurrection from the dead gives the hope reserved in heaven for you. And we look forward to the promised reunion when Christ shall raise our dead from their graves and we shall ever be with the Lord. Dr. Ralph Martin, pastor of the Memorial Baptist Church in Rocky, Illinois, is coming to sing for us.
Mr. Ralph Matthews from here at Decatur will come and lead us as we sing over a thousand tons to sing. Dr. Parker's collection of 65 years worth of sermons began with the text in Philippians 4, verse 13. I can do all things through Christ which strengtheneth me. I think Dr. Parker's life characterizes that verse. For those of you who have had the privilege of getting an autographed copy of his biography, or you have had him sign your Bible, you know that he always signed Psalm 91 under his name. And we want to read that. That was his favorite psalm, his favorite text. He quoted it often. He quoted it right to the very end. And we want to read that today. Psalm 91. He that dwelleth in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. I will say of the Lord, He is my refuge and my fortress. My God, in Him will I trust. Surely he shall deliver thee from the snare of the fowler and from the noisome pestilence. He shall cover thee with his feathers, and under his wings shalt thou trust. His truth shall be thy shield and buckler. Thou shalt not be afraid for the terror by night, nor for the air that flieth by day, nor for the pestilence that walketh in darkness, nor for the destruction that wasteth at noonday. A thousand shall fall at thy side, and ten thousand at thy right hand, but it shall not come nigh thee. Only with thine eyes shalt thou behold and see the reward of the wicked, because thou hast made the Lord, which is my refuge, even the Most High, thy habitation. There shall no evil befall thee, neither shall any plague come nigh thy dwelling. For he shall give his angels charge over thee to keep thee in all thy ways. They shall bear thee up in their hands, lest thou dash thy foot against a stone. Thou shalt tread upon the lion and adder, the young lion and the dragon, shalt thou trample under feet. Because he hath set his love upon me, therefore will I deliver him. I will set him on high, because he hath known my name. He shall call upon me, and I will answer him. I will be with him in trouble. I will deliver him and honor him. With long life will I satisfy him and show him my salvation. Each of you should have the words to six stanzas. I'll go for a thousand tongues to sing. Let's stand as we sing together on all stanzas.
When the teacher first walked into the class that first day, there walked into my life a man who was to become my example, my counselor, my hero, and my friend. That man was Dr. Monroe Parker. He had one passion which he shared with us constantly, let souls for Jesus be your battle cry. Don't ever put the gospel train on a sidetrack. And don't be a compromiser. Sometimes you would add a dirty, miserable compromiser. <laughs> I was overwhelmed by the forcefulness of this man's challenge and I knew my teacher was somebody extra special. He was a man sent from God. I graduated from Bob Jones University and seminary in 1953 and found myself in a little church in the hills of West Virginia. I wanted to get started right and that meant knocking on doors and telling people about Jesus. It soon dawned on me that to accomplish that goal, in part, I needed an evangelist, someone to help bring in the harvest. But who in the world would be willing to come to my little church? For that matter, who could find it? We were so far back in the woods. It was then I remembered something my teacher said. Fellows, when you get too big for a little church, you're too big. Now was the time to put that statement to the test. <laughs> Sometimes we younger preachers didn't think it all through. Dr. Parker accepted the invitation and he came to a little town called Dixie, West Virginia. As he always did, he found the place. He was there just three nights, Sunday night, Monday night, and a Tuesday night. We could not announce it on the radio. We had no newspaper. We didn't have time to print up any announcements because he simply called and said, I have three days free. Could you use me? Well, what could I say? He came three days, no advertisement, no announcement, except what we could do knocking on doors and telling people come to church. But what a meeting we had. He stayed in our home, he ate at our table, he loved our family, he shared his humor. When I looked at him in the casket, I could think back to that time when we first met him in our home, and that little smile, it was always there just waiting to break through. And he always had a joke to tell, <laughs> always. <laughs> We quickly realized that above all else, we had in our home and in our church not so much a great man, a great intellectual giant, and that he was, but we had with us another sinner, saved by grace. He made that very plain. One morning at the breakfast table, I dared to ask him to do something which after asking him, I thought, you are crazy. Dr. Parker, would you, for my wife, imitate Dr. Bob Jones Sr. <laughs> and Dr. Bob Jones, uh, or Dr. Uh, uh, Billy Sunny, those were the two I wanted him to do. And to my utter amazement, he did. <laughs> he had come down uh, to the table, very informally dressed, and there he is at the kitchen table, Carol's home, the hills of West Virginia, imitating Billy Sunday. I will never, never forget that or my wife. <laughs> In school, Dr. Parker told me the importance of being a soul winner. And during those three days he was with us in Dixie, West Virginia, he went a step further. He took a young preacher boy by the hand and showed him 
how to be a soul winner. He went with me on visitation the first place we stopped. I knocked on the door gently. No answer. I was relieved. <laughs> Dr. Parker wasn't. He said, Randy, you want somebody to answer the door, don't you? Yes, sir. Well, you have to let them know you're out here. <laughs> he folded up his fist. It looked like a sledgehammer at the time. He banged on that door. And sure enough, somebody answered. <laughs> the man who answered had shaving cream all over his face, his razor in his hand. For a moment, I thought he was about to use it on us as he very gruffly said, What do you want? Shaving cream on his face, razor in his hand, Dr. Parker began to witness. And when we left that home, the man was saved. <laughs> we were going up one of those famous collars in West Virginia. And as we were walking along, we spotted a man on the roof of his house to this young preacher boy, we'll stop here later. He's busy now. The Dr. Parker knew he might not be that way by that way again. So we stopped then. From ground level, he witnessed to the man up on the roof of the house. When that conversation ended, he was down the ladder on his knees, accepted Christ as a Savior. I'll never forget those hands-on lessons that I was privileged to have with Dr. Parker. I said what a meeting it was. We had 22 adults saved at the close of those three days. The building had been packed every night, but the people had not come to hear a great Dr. Monroe Parker. They didn't know who Dr. Monroe Parker was. They had come to hear a man who had a burning passion for souls, a man that had been sent there from God. I've been with Dr. Parker many, many times over the years, and every time we have met and had any kind of an extended conversation, Dr. Parker has always called attention to that meeting. He remembers the man with the shaving cream on his face. He remembered the man up on the roof. He remembered the 22 people. I didn't have to review him. He reviewed me. He never forgot. I think I can pre speak for a lot of the little preachers around this world who never make the headlines. And I can honestly say that Dr. Parker, as great a man as he was, never went out and showed that greatness. He was always just a friend. He never made me or my wife, our family, ever feel inferior. We never felt put down. We always felt at home, relaxed. We felt like a friend had come to see us. Dr. Parker is a special man. He was my teacher, my example, my counselor, my hero. But most of all, my friend. We're suffering a loss, and having a game, I'm sure, He'd already had that abundant entrance that Peter speaks about. I met Dr. Parker first uh, 52 years ago. He was my first Bible teacher. He taught the majority of the Bible classes in college. He was also director of religious activities and uh, charge of the Ministerial Association. I remember he called me in once and said, Wayne, you're not showing enough souls. Uh, he report. I said, Dr. Parker, you go to church I did. And he, I said, look, you come out and see if you can get them. And we came out, this old church had a feud. They'd be killing each other. 
in the mountains there by Athens. And uh, so he came out and we uh, had a meeting and how many were, weren't saved? About half of them, about 200 people there. Half of them weren't saved. And I know Dr. Parker said, this is going to be ice cream. He didn't get one of them. He never said no. <laughs> it was, you don't get it when they're killing each other. You know? <laughs> appreciated this man. He's been you know, one of the men that I, I'm going to really miss him just knowing he's not here. Uh, he uh, was a great counselor. He was a Bible teacher. And then we, about the same time, pulled out of the Southern Convention together. And uh, he gave me great counsel. He kept me from extreme positions. I'm a tendency to be a radical. And he helped me to take the position without being radical and a number of issues. And I've really appreciated that through the years. And then that evangelist, first meeting he held with me, we had a menagerie tent. We got the Ringling Brothers free. It was 35 feet wide, 150 feet long, and it was like a hot dog. But uh, we had a tremendous meeting. We had many souls that later on were leaders of my church out of that meeting. And then we uh, got into the uh, conservative Baptist together. He had that college, and I was on the executive committee. And did we have fun fighting? Now, I hate to say that. But there's sometimes, it's a great joy to stand up for Jesus. And uh, uh, he always fought nobly, fairly kindly. <laughs> and and uh, well, but it was, it, was, it was a great memory from those days. And then through the years since, and the missions outreach here, I've been with him on the fields and here at home. At the, uh, I was driving into Decatur. I used to be drive that drive at least once a year, sometimes twice a year, uh, from Nashville in the year, and to be with the board. Uh, what, a, what, a, what a leader he was for us. Uh, he led our mission, and his reputation uh, enhanced it tremendously. So uh, we were, we're, the mission will miss Dr. Parker. Uh, what a blessing he was. You know, he was a loyal man. The royal, he was loyal to his alma mater. I'm very, I know very few men, graduates of Bible University, who have been so consistently loyal. I mean, really loyal. And he's loyal to friends of his. He was sympathetic. Uh, when my wife passed away, uh, Parker was one of the first ones to be concerned. And I appreciate their concern. They both of them knew what I was going through. And uh, they were able to show real sympathy and help from heaven. Uh, I'm going to miss that kind of a man and that kind of an interest. Uh, he had scriptural balance. Uh, that verse in Matthew 16, 18, I think is where it says, Upon this rock I'll build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Of course, the word hell is Hades. At that point, both the saved and the lost went there, one one side, one the other, and uh, uh, really should read. I suppose the gates of Hades meaning death. The early church was to face immediately the beginning of the losses of their great leaders. And uh, our Lord was simply saying, death, robbing of some of uh, the ranks will not prevail against the church. As we lost a great man, we know God knows all about it. He's the one that called him home. Others will come to take his place. Sometimes you have a, a number of giants in one period, and then later on you'll have another group of giants. A great preacher once told me years ago that as the apostasy darkens, we'll have fewer believers, but we'll have more giants. Something about the trial that builds the giants. We went through in the 30s and 40s a peculiar kind of trial where everybody was in a denomination. Dr. Parker was in that fight, and praise the Lord, I got into it too where we had to create a new group, and we did. By the grace of God, we can do it again. I'm going to start the problem. I come from the younger generation of uh, those who had the privilege of being under the ministry of Dr. Parker. He was my first Bible college president. He was a preacher. He always said, keep the pulpit hot, and he certainly did. The messages that we heard, even though we heard them every year, were always a conviction and a great challenge to us. He was our inspiration. 
in college his uh, stories experiences of the things that he had been through years before the uh, victories that God had given they were a great challenge to us they built our faith in a great God and what God could do if we would step out for him Dr. Parker was our example not that we were to imitate him his actions or his way of preaching but perhaps even unconsciously his his convictions his principles uh, became a part of our lives and our ministry as we've gone out to serve the Lord his imperative for witnessing soul winning building churches preaching and these were impressed upon us and I came to Pillsbury with the conviction that God had called me into missions and these things were further strengthened and, and uh, a, a greater burden laid upon us as we began to look uh, very specifically toward the mission field. But it's the mission field particularly that I would like to relate to this morning for just a few moments. Dr. Parker was our general director at Baptist World Mission for most of these years that we've been in the land of Uruguay. Twice he came to visit us, clear down to Uruguay, South America. Some of you may not even know where it is, but uh, it's down, uh, it's in South America, uh, down, uh, down a long ways. But what a special time, well, what special times those were when he came to, uh, came to see us. He came to preach to us. He preached to us as missionaries. He, he preached uh, to the people, preached in uh, services where, uh, where he had to be translated. I had the privilege of translating a message that uh, he preached on the cross. You may remember uh, his, uh, his eloquent messages on the cross. And as he began to graphically describe the crucifixion, I found myself uh, terribly at a loss for words to know how to translate it uh, into in the Spanish uh, like it ought to have been. And then as he slipped into some poetry, that was even worse. <laughs> and, uh, in spite of that, the people greatly appreciated Dr. Parker. They loved him. He was a special person uh, to them, even though they could not speak his language. Dr. Parker, in our home, uh, did something very special for us. Uh, this has been commented on before, but you know, missionaries missionaries live stressful lives. They live uh, very demanding lives many times. And Dr. Parker caused us to relax and to laugh and as he told uh, told those jokes around the table and so on. It was uh, it was a, a very a very special, different time for us as, as missionaries, being out on the field and, and being uh, many times lonely from the fellowship that we, those of you here in the States, get to enjoy so often. Dr. Parker gave us an ear. He was uh, interested in us as missionaries. He asked questions. A lot of times missionaries are special private breed of people and, uh, but he could ask the right question he listened to our problems and then he gave us counsel and that was uh, so neat and so important Dr. Parker prayed for us as missionaries the custom of his life was the fourth watch of the night was his time to pray for the missionaries. Praying for them by, by name, one after the other. And we counted it a great privilege to have been remembered daily in his, in his prayers. You know, he paid attention to our children. He was, uh, he was like a special grandfather to our children. He's always been very special to them. He was their greatest preacher. A very 
special friend. And even after he had been in Uruguay a couple of times, and we came with the family, we came through Decatur. He took time to go miniature golfing with our family, with the children, and they've never forgotten that. He asked about the children, and he prays for them. And they love him especially for that. Dr. Parker loved the Lord, and he loved us as missionaries. He always signed his letters, your friend. And he was that, a great friend to us, a champion for missions and for the missionaries. Thank you, Dr. Parker. Before this mass media mess came in our lives, someone made the statement that every one of us, every one of our lives has been made, influenced by the books we have read and by the paths of the lives we've crossed. And that certainly is true. I'm thankful for three men who crossed the path of my life. The first one was Dr. Bob Jones Sr. It was under him I was saved. And then the next year in our church, Dr. Bob Jones Jr. came. And it was under that meeting that I was called to preach. And uh, he, I was, then I was planning to go to Wheaton, and he'd say, you better come to Bob Jones. Uh, I'm, I'm so thankful I listened to him, but I didn't get there just because he said it. It was that Wheaton said they couldn't take me, and uh, I'd have to wait a while, and I wrote Bob Jones and got an airmail letter back and said I could come right away. <laughs> on the way to school, I stopped by Wheaton and told, went to see a man by the name of Dr. Durness and asked, he said, will you go to Bob Jones for a semester and then you can come back? But when I went to Bob Jones, I walked into a class, the Preacher Boys class, the title in those days, The Preacher and His Problems. And uh, Dr. Monroe Parker was the teacher. I've never forgotten it, as many of you have not. When you walked in, they stood and sang, Souls for Jesus is our battle cry. Souls for Jesus will fight until we die. We never will give in while souls are lost in sin. Amen. Did something to me. And Dr. Parker led that class. And one along, I wrote Dr. Bernice a letter and said, forget it. <laughs> <laughs> I found what I want. And uh, thank God for the impression Dr. Parker made on my life. He taught us boys to be faithful to the Word of God, to stand for the Bible. And, uh, you know, he, he taught us to be separatists. He was a militant separatist, but always gracious and kind. Firm but gracious. You never had to doubt where he stood. You knew Dr. Parker was a separatist, but he was gracious about it, and he taught us boys that. I, I was thinking of a passage of Scripture, 1 Thessalonians 2, 3 and 3 to 8 comes to mind. Our exhortation was not of deceit, nor of uncleanness, nor of guile. But as we were allowed of God to be put in trust for the gospel, even so we speak. Not as pleasing men, boy, he drove that home. Not as pleasing men, but God who trieth our hearts. Neither at any time used we flattering words, as you know. Nor a cloak of covetousness. God is our witness. And the next one was if. Very important too. Nor of men sought we glory. Neither of you nor yet of others, when we might have been burdensome as the apostles of Christ. And the next verse, but we were gentle among you, even as a nurse cherisheth her children. And the next verse doesn't come to mind. It's the same idea. He said you were it ends with you were dear unto us. I can't quite bring it to mind now. But he drilled that into us to preach with love and to stand true to the Word of God. He's been a lot to us, my wife and me. He walked my wife down the aisle to give her away to me. When uh, we were married, uh, Dr. Bob Jr. performed the ceremony in the War Memorial Chapel. Uh, we haven't had war since, though. <laughs> uh, but, uh, then Dr. Parker, I came to know him as a mentor in many, many ways. 
He was a member. He and his family. My wife taught John, taught Penny in our school there. They were students there. Their family were in our church. He was. I was his pastor for a time. And then he was a leader. He led us in our fight that Brother Van Gelder referred to in the conservative Baptist movement. He was president of Pillsbury, president of the Minnesota Baptist Convention. And uh, he was the influence that helped us to realize we needed to stand where we are, where we did stand, and where we needed to stand. And I thank God for that. And uh, then the day came, we needed a man to lead Baptist World Mission. Thank God for the day when Dr. Parker said, I will accept the general directorship. I about fell over when he said it. I couldn't believe he would do it. I thought he'd last a little while. He stayed with it until he went home to be with the Lord. And Dr. Parker led this mission, as Brother Morris told you, to what it is today. All of you know this. You, I go out around the country, and they'd say, oh, you're on a mission board. What board are you on? I'd say, Baptist World Mission. They'd say, Baptist World Mission. Oh, you mean Dr. Parker's board. <laughs> you ever had that happen? Yeah. And, uh, uh, and it was Dr. Parker's board. As I look over you fellas today, and I've been around the mission since its inception, all of you men were quite definitely handpicked by Dr. Monroe Parker. He'd say, we need this man, we need this man. And I thank God for what God did through Dr. Monroe Parker. I thank God for the privilege of having known him and had him as a friend and uh, I thank God for you, Ruby, and what you meant in his life and how he was able to go on and lead our mission and continue on in the work of the Lord. I'm on a time limit, so I will say thank God for the ministry of Dr. Monroe Park. <laughs>
I'm so glad he had that sense of humor. I've never known a man who was faithful to God to the end, a strong preacher, who didn't have a love for brethren and a sense of humor. And I believe that when the sense of humor dries up in a man's heart, he's pretty useless as far as the gospel is concerned. Now that's strange. I can't point to the scripture to prove it. But I can point to a hundred examples. It's a wonderful thing to have a friend for 66 years to whom you could go with your problems, who understood them because he had the same problems, who had the same difficulties, but a friend who was always completely loyal, who tried to always see the best in the situation, but who would never compromise the truth of the Word of God, or even for friendship's sake, should a friend ask it, and I never did, turn from the truth of the word and the calling of God to reach the gospel. His family have been in my heart. Ruby, close, close friend over these years. I don't know whether it's proper to funeral like this to go to a man's first two wives, but Monk always did. He spoke about the wife of his youth and the wife of his middle age and the wife of his old age. And if I had to pick one above the others, I don't know which I would pick. No man was ever so fortunate. What wonderful women they were. His first wife was a cousin of mine, had the same birthday I had, though she was two years younger. We always celebrated together. And then Margie, his second wife, was my father's secretary and very like a sister to me. And then Ruby. I helped to negotiate that arrangement. <laughs> think of all the things I ever did as a friend for Monk, that, that was the most rich and fruitful and blessed of the Lord. What a joy to look back upon life, unmarred, unspoiled, unharmed, a rich and long life fully lived for the Lord. Amen. I have a strange text for a funeral sermon. It's that verse so familiar from the hundredth psalm. Enter into his gates with thanksgiving and into his courts with praise. The Lord laid this verse on my heart when I got the news of Dr. Parker's home going. They said he passed away just about church time on Sunday morning. Enter into his courts. He wasn't in the earthly house. He hadn't assembled to praise God with his brethren here on earth but he entered into the heavenly courts. What a surprise that must have been. I know I'll be surprised when I get to heaven. I'm sure I'm going by the grace of God, but somehow I can't believe it, that God will take up a sinner, save him, prepare a mansion for him, and take him home to heaven. Part of their illness, sleeping, almost comatose and suddenly in realms of glory. What a wonderful thing that is. I'm sure there were lots of folks there to meet him. I'm sure he got a warm welcome because that arrival was an abundant one. He didn't sneak in the back way. <laughs> the bands played. He came through the gates, lifted up, and he was met at the foot of the throne by the Lord of glory. An abundant entrance. You remember Peter in his second epistle <clears throat> prays that some of his people will have an entrance abundantly into eternal life and into heaven. And he sets forth certain reasons for an abundant entrance. First of all, they make their calling and their election sure. That has to do with salvation. For though a Calvinist may believe that some people are elected and some people are called and they can't get out of it, there has to be a time when a decision is made and a commitment and an acceptance and a recognition of one's unworthiness and that it's all for the blood of Christ. That's the gospel. Peter had that seal, that vision. First of all, you make that sure. And then from there he goes on. And he wants them to have an abundant entrance because they live and show through their lives 
the change, the miracle, the new birth. And those who do that, he said, will have an abundant entrance. Dr. Parker did that. He preached the gospel. He brought men to know Christ. He trained young men and women to serve the Lord. In these testimonies and testimonial state, you've heard how he trained preachers. He built up churches. He had a vision for works of God around the world. He had an abundant entrance because he had an abundant service. And nothing was withheld through all those years. He's going to be badly missed. And yet I cannot help but think how wonderful God times everything. It was time for Dr. Parker to go or he wouldn't have gone. How much better to go at the peak of a ministry, still useful, gloriously into God's presence, amazed to be there undoubtedly, and yet certain of arrival, and know you have done all you can while you were here to bring others with you. How much better to go then than to be frustrated, unable to preach, bound down by old age, limited. My prayer always is that when I can no longer be useful, dear Lord, take me home quick. I'm sure no man wants to be left to be a burden and a nuisance. And how wonderful it is to go while one is still in the ministry, rich and fruitful and abundant. And then he met an abundant and wonderful company there. In Hebrews, the writer talks about having come to certain things, to Mount Zion, to the heavenly Jerusalem. Wonderful how he speaks of all these things there, and I want to look at some of them briefly this morning. He speaks of all these things, and of course he's talking about the contrast of the old dispensation with the new. He's speaking about the things we have come to learn, to understand, that we're under different governments now than they were in Old Testament times. But the things he describes there are all things we'll find in the heavenly Jerusalem. And how wonderful to be in a place where all these things are. To an innumerable company of angels. Lots of them there. I like angels. I have a few that are personal friends of mine. Now, I don't know their names, but I've run into them along the local the of life somewhere. I'm not speaking now of mysticism or that sort of thing. But God gives an angel charge over us to bear us up in our, our, their hands lest we dash our foot against a stone. The long way of life, I've encountered an angel who's lifted me up a few times, very aware of it. Uh, there are angels who minister to the needs of the people of God. And there are angel messengers of God whom God sends at times to meet the needs of people and to give a sense of uplift, a consciousness that more is present than you can see. I am looking forward to seeing some of them invisible now or in likeness of human form, but then we'll see them. The Bible doesn't tell us angels sing, but I have a notion that angels must sing. They never know the joy of sins forgiven because these angels have never fallen from the presence of the Lord, but I think surely they must, they must sing. And even an angel's voice in speaking must ring like music. Holy, holy, holy. What a company. What a glorious group gathered around. Air power overhead. Camping round about us here to protect us from the enemy in life. And welcoming, welcoming us when we get to heaven. <coughs> to the church of the first ball written in heaven. Some of us have had some experiences with churches. The first church of this town and the first church of that town. But I don't think any of us have ever seen a church that was made up entirely of the people who were the people of the firstborn, whose names are written in heaven. 
not just on a roll down here, but on a roll up there. And some will be there because Dr. Parker brought them to the Lord and saw that through their faith in him, their names were set down. Wonderful group that is. A church where there are no dissidents. A church without division, without strife, without antagonism, without backbiting, without heresy, without compromise, without traitors. What a blessed company that will be. And to the judge of all, and to the spirits of just men made perfect. I have lots of friends that are almost perfect, but never quite. And I'm very much aware of the fact that I fall far short of it. But just men, that is, men justified, made righteous. But that's not all. A lots of righteous people can sometimes be annoying. But righteous people, justified by faith and perfected, because the flesh is gone now, and they've seen him, and they're like him. Oh, how attractive saints will be in glory. Amen. Sometimes down here, not so attractive, because the flesh is there. But oh, in that day, when the just men have been made perfect, and to Jesus, the mediator of the new covenant, his name is far down in the list in Hebrews. But he's the one we want to see first of all. The mediator of the new covenant. The one who made the covenant. This is my blood shed for you. The one who is our judge. But thank God who took our judgment on the cross. The negotiator of the covenant. This new covenant so much better than the law for the law condemns us all but by grace we are saved through faith that not of ourselves it's the gift of God not of works lest we should boast what a savior sometime I shall not care that mountains hide if summit against the blue of the sky I shall not care that roses blossom forth serenely fair, for I shall see his face, and all earth's wonders, all of nature's grace, shall fade before the beauty of that sight as candle flame burns dim when day grows bright. The light of the place, the light of our lives, and the blood sprinkling that speaks better things than that of Abel. Brethren, you may not believe that the blood's preserved in heaven. And I would not raise the argu theological arguments here today, for I would honor the Lord and the man who served the Lord and who would rejoice to see the Lord honored. But I believe the blood's going to be preserved in heaven. That blood of sprinkling, there that we shall be able to see that blood that cleansed, that precious, precious blood. But if not, if it's in this description, but not actually in heaven itself, thank God for that blood. Amen. For it's by that blood that we were washed from our sins and brought to be kings and priests unto God, children of the Most High, called to His service, and I pray that when the time comes that I shall stand in his presence, not to receive the reward, for that doesn't come until the final end of all things. When all the little wavelets have touched the shore, the result of a life can be fully known. But I hope that when I stand in his presence and meet the friends and loved ones and meet Dr. Parker, I can meet with a record of loyalty and faithfulness like his and not be ashamed to look him in the eye because I somehow have failed him but most of all for fear that I may have failed the Savior <laughs> to him be glory Amen. Amen Our Heavenly Father we gather today to remember and pay tribute to a great hero of faith Dr. John Monroe Parker Lord, as I was reading in Joshua this morning, 
heard that great comment about his faithfulness. I thought, Lord, how faithful Dr. Parker has been. Like Joshua, one who has wholly followed the Lord his God. Although our hearts rejoice in the knowledge that Dr. Parker is with you, our eyes, Lord, are filled with tears today. Not tears for him, for he had a full and fruitful life in ministry and was in your presence right now. But rather tears for us, those who are left behind. And not only are there tears being shed here, Lord, but there are tears being shed around the world today by pastors and faithful missionaries who love Dr. Parker and look to him for example and especially for the support of his prayers. Lord, we're reminded in the word of God that the effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man availed much. And one of the great ministries that Dr. Parker had for all of us was that ministry of prayer. Like those missionaries and pastors, I will miss his prayers and his encouragement and his example. Lord, grant that young men will understand the great loss of a Dr. Parker. And through his life and testimony will volunteer to stand in the gap and make up the hedge in that great cause of world evangelism. Heavenly Father, I pray that you will be with Ruby and with John and Penny and with all the family today. Surround them with your arms of comfort and peace and grace. Lord, I ask that you would extend your arms around us as well. Thank you, Lord, for all of the faithful men and women gathered in this place today. Lord, some in this audience were led to Christ by Dr. Parker. All of us have been touched and challenged by his life. Thank you, Lord, for the impact that he's made on us. We ask, Lord, that you would give us strength to carry on the work that Dr. Parker dedicated his life to, that is, the spreading of the gospel around the world and the encouraging of Christians along the way. Lord, may we stand as straight and as sweet as he did. Thank you, Lord, for the memory, the example, and the challenge of a John Monroe Parker. Thank you for your love for us as he so eloquently preached your love for the whole world. Lord, we'd like to say today that we thank you for the privilege of having known you. That we love you and we commit our lives to you again today. That we might faithfully continue in the service that you've called us to you. Now to him who is able to keep you from falling, and to present you faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy. To the only wise God, our Savior, the glory, the majesty, and dominion, and power, both now and forever. Amen. Cox plays for us on his horn. Larry's Ruby's son-in-law and he's going to play at this time.
Beyond the Sunset. Wonderful thought, isn't it? Reminds me of the scripture that says our citizenship is in heaven, not down here. And whence also we look for the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who will change our body of humiliation, that it might be fashioned like unto his body of glory, according to the working wherein he's able even to subdue all things to himself. I would certainly be remiss if I did not mention, as we place Dr. Parker's body in the grave today, the tremendous impact that he had upon my life. I listened intently as others mentioned that today, and many more could have done so. I do thank God for the tremendous life that he lived as an example for many of us who are in the Lord's work today. And as a very young boy, when I went to Bob Jones College, as it was in those days, I met him and was the head of the preacher's class, as was mentioned today, and what a privilege it was to come back a year ago a little better and work with him for at least a year, Baptist World Mission, and with his dear wife, Ruby, whom we came to know and love more than we had known her previously. We leaned over his coffin yesterday, and Ruby said to my wife and I, I said he's not here that's right. and that certainly is true he's not here many of you some of the younger ones never knew Dr. Parker when he had a virile and strong physical body because in recent years he aged as all of us are doing and will do I remember Randy Carroll was mentioning about him imitating Billy Sunday. I remember he used to do that almost every year for us in the preacher boys class. We had to egg him on to do it a little bit, but he'd finally do it. And he'd run up and down the platform, and he'd jump on the chair and sometimes on the pulpit to show how Billy Sunday gave the invitation. My, what a body he had. I mean, he is strong, football player, tremendous body of strength. But, of course, as I've mentioned, our bodies deteriorate. Mine's deteriorated a lot, and yours has too, probably. And all of us eventually will deteriorate, and we will die unless Jesus comes. But even though he had those ailments in his latter months and years, he just went on for God. And what a blessing it was to see him do it. I pray God will keep me that faithful when I am the age at which he was. If Christ be preached that he rose from the dead, how say some among you that there is no resurrection of the dead? But if there be no resurrection of the dead, then is Christ not risen? And if Christ be not risen, our preaching is vain, and your faith is also vain. But now is Christ risen from the dead? Thank God for that. The scripture says, Thou fool, that which thou sowest is not quickened except it die, but God gives it a body as it pleased him, to every seed his own. So is the resurrection of the dead. It's sown in corruption. We have the body in which Dr. Parker lived. For these 85 years we have it here, but as we've said, he's not here. It's sown in corruption, but it's raised in incorruption. It's sown in dishonor, but it's raised in glory. It's sown in weakness. It's raised in power. It's sown a natural body, it's raised a spiritual body. Behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trump. For the trumpet shall sound, and the dead shall be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, the scripture says. When this corruptible shall have put on incorruption, this mortal shall have put on immortality, then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, Death is swallowed up in victory. O death, where is thy sting? O grave, where is thy victory? The sting of death is sin. The strength of sin is the law. But thanks be to God, which gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, my beloved brethren, be ye steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord. For as much as you know that your labor 
is not in vain in the Lord. I guess the last memories, aside from the final depart, uh, the final to stay, t stop at his bedside the other day, was the time when Miss Parker slipped out to do some things with my wife the other day, and I sat with Dr. Parker for a few hours in his home. And we talked about many things about the work of God and the work of the mission and so on. And I just think of him as a way this scripture describes it. Steadfast, unmovable, and always abounding in the word of the Lord. <laughs> he was that. And I think he would bid us to be that if he were to rise up here and tell us that today. Right. Until that day when Jesus comes and we all gather to meet him in the air. Thank God for Dr. Parker. Amen. I thank God for him. He had a tremendous impact on my life. And for Mrs. Parker and the others uh, as well. And I think it well behooves us as we gather at this graveside to just recommit ourselves to the Lord today. I'd like to do that. I would like in some way to emulate this great man who had an impact on my life and the impact an impact on so many others, many who are gathered here today. Now I think it'd be a good time for us to just rededicate ourselves. To serve God and the saint with the same fervor and devotion that Dr. Monroe Parker served. Him. None of us can rise to that height, but we can try by God's grace and help. I'd like us to just bow our heads as for a moment of prayer and I'm going to pray and commit his body to the ground but before we do that I, I'd like each of us myself included to just say Lord I want you to have all there is of me just as you had all there was of Dr. Monroe Parker let's just around this grave site at this time rededicate ourselves thank you that he died on Calvary for our sins and rose again. And all we have or hope to have, we, it lies in him. We know Dr. Parker preached that and lived that for all these years. We thank you for him. We thank you for the memory of him. We thank you for the impact that he's had on many of our lives, a great impact. We thank you for the thousands that have come to know Jesus Christ as Savior because of his ministry and life and testimony. Thank you, Father, for the way you've used him in the mission, at this world mm -hmm. mission, as well as in other places. Mm -hmm. And Lord, as we commit this body to the ground, we know that he's not here. He's rejoicing in the glory. Amen. And having a great time, we're sure, as he celebrates his homecoming there. Keep us faithful, as he was faithful, until that day when the shadows flee away and we see the king in his beauty. Yes. Hey. Bless Ruby. Give her real strength. And Lord, help her to know afresh that you are with her. For John and Penny. And for other loved ones and friends who are gathered here. And Lord, we dedicate ourselves again to the gospel that Monroe Parker preached. And the Christ that he uplifted and the principles for which he stood. Oh, God, help us to be faithful until that day when we see Jesus in the glory. Mm -hmm. Commit his body into this ground with a certain hope that the body's going to come out of the grave someday. New body, strong body, a resurrection body. Thank you for that blessed hope. Dismiss us now from this place with the thought of the life of this great man in our minds that we might also strive by your grace to live for you till you come for us. Mm -hmm. In Jesus' precious name we pray. Amen. Hey. We thank you for being here today and pray that this service and the service that preceded will be an inspiration to you to live for the Lord Jesus Christ. You're dismissed from this service. Thank you. 